Good evening. Welcome to another tutorial session on electric drives. We've done a lot and I hope you have revised. If you've not watched the old videos, can you do so before today's class? Okay. So today we we'll look at traveling time. This is where we go to the last time. We got we go to traveling time of induction motors. Last time we dealt with traveling time of DC motors, right? And we saw the formula for traveling time of DC motors. Today we look at how to find the traveling time of induction motors. Now, what you must do is that at this point of the course, it's more, it's more formula work. The traveling time of induction motors is formula work. So we'll see the formulas, go straight to the examples. And then when we're having a crash course on solving examples, we'll see how the formulas are used more. Yeah. So let's move on. So now I'll give you the formula straightforward. I'll give you the formula straightforward. Okay. So the traveling time of induction motors, we use about five, six formulas. Yes, let me see. Five, six formulas. So let's see. Let's let's see the formulas that we'll be using. Okay. So now you can, you can, you can be asked to compute the traveling time t. Right? Traveling time t is equal to tau over 2k multiplying s1 squared minus s2 squared over 2s m max plus s m max log to the base e s1 over s2 plus 2b s max s1 minus s2 so this is the formula we we'll use to compute the traveling time of an induction motor we saw what traveling time was the traveling time is the time taking for the motor or the drive to change from one steady state value to another steady state value upon a disturbance right so let's say you are breaking or you are changing you have you have applied some disturbance to the system the time it takes how you compute the time so this s1 is the slip the slip of the initial steady state s2 is the slip of the second steady state value so let's find what these are so i need to find tau so this, this is my first formula right so for me i can say where tau is equal to j omega s over t max so tau is j omega s over t max. Omega s is synchronous speed. J is moment of inertia. T max. How do I find t max? T max. So this, this can be my second formula. T max is equal to V L squared line voltage squared over two times synchronous speed multiplying R one plus R one squared x e squared square root of this. As I said these are formula works. So here I need tau. I'm finding tau, right? I need to find T max. There's T max here. There's T max here. So this has to find the T max. Now I also need to find S max. S max. So that can be my third formula. S max. S max is equal to R2 prime over square root of R1 squared plus X E squared. This is my S max. This is my S max. Now over here to also need this k, I need to find this k here. So that can, that's another parameter, k. k is equal to b s max plus 1. b s max plus 1. That's how you find your k. Now how do I find b? So is it like, it's like, it's, so b is equal to, b is equal to r1 over r2 prime. So if I find my B here, I can find my K, but I can't find K without finding S max. So first I find my, this is the first thing I find B. Second, I find my S max. Once I have my B and S max, I can find K. This is the third thing I'll find. If I have K, it means I know this K here, right? I found S max, so I know S max here. I have to find tau. But to find tau, I need T max, so I'll find T max here, D. Once I have T max, I can find my tau, and then 
I can go ahead to compute my traveling time. So that will be the order. That will be the order of. That will be the order in which we will compute. So that's it. Okay. Now, another thing that we can be asked to find and that this traveling time of induction motors is the optimum time, right? The optimum time is the minimum time that it will take for the drive to settle at the new steady state value. The minimum time that it will take. Okay. So I can call that one T min. Now, to find that T min, I need a certain S max called S max optimum. You see, optimization, optimization is like, is if say if, if you're trying to optimize cost, you're finding the lowest cost. We optimize cost with lowest cost. If you are optimizing profit, you find the highest profit. So optimization is like do with finding maximum or minimum things. So I'll find some S S max optimum. The optimum value of an S max that will give me the minimum time. Okay, so my S max optimum, that can be my sixth formula. So if you're supposed to find the minimum time or optimize the time or whatever, you must find your S max opt. S max optimum, S max optimum is equal to, so you must know this formula too. It's equal to S1 squared minus S2 squared over two multiplying log to the base B E S1 over S2 plus 2B S1 minus S2. Now, one thing you must notice is that if, if they told you to neglect the stator resistance, that's R1. If you neglect R1, it means that anywhere that there's a B becomes zero. It means B becomes zero. When B becomes zero, it means you can say that, okay, this component B becomes zero, means here goes away. When B becomes zero too, this component goes away. This goes to zero. This goes to zero because B goes to zero. So I've seen a question where we're asked to neglect the resistance, the stator resistance, meaning that B becomes zero. And it means anywhere there's a B in the formula, it goes to zero. Anywhere there's a B in the formula, it goes to zero. Okay, let, let's move on. So these are the formulas that we need. Now, I said that you find some S max optimum, right? That will give you the minimum time or the optimum time. Now, for the S max optimum too, there's some R2 prime optimum. So if I make if I make S max optimum here, S max optimum to be equal to R2 prime optimum over square root of R1 squared plus XE squared. So if I want to find R2 prime optimum, R2 prime optimum will be equal to S max optimum, S max optimum times square root of R1 squared plus XE, square root of R1 squared plus XE squared. Square root of R1 squared plus XE squared. So that's it. So that's it. That's how you go about it. Okay. So, so these are the formulas that we we'll need in the traveling time of the of traveling time of induction motors. These are the formulas we we'll need in the traveling time of induction motors. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we can go straight into looking at some examples. Let's see. So the main formula here is this the formulas I stated. All these were deriving. So this formula is the main formula here. Everything, all the rest are like steps in deriving the formula. All right, sure. So I think that when B is zero, the formula reduces into this. Anyway, there's a B becomes zero. So the formula becomes this. So as you can see here. And see the formula becomes reduces to that. So, 
S3 face 400 volt 6 pole 650 hectare connected one roto induction motor. As a sum of roto and roto liquid reactants refer to state of one ohm. So the sum of state of and roto leakage. So they give me Xe. That's the Xe. Right? Xc1. Preferred. So I've given me Xe to be one. In this. Hello. Okay. I've been giving my X E to be one ohm. Now I've also been told that it is connected to a balanced 400 volt supply and drives a pure inertia load. So voltage is 400 volts. Okay. The moment of inertia of roto, including the load, is 10 kilogram meter squared. So J is 10 kilogram meter squared. Direct online starting is used, and the roto circuit re resistance is adjusted so that the motor brings its load from rest to 0 0.95 of synchronous speed. So they say that what the motor is from rest, from rest. Do that as rest means the slip, the initial speed is what? The initial slip, S1, is 1. If something is at rest or it has stopped, the slip is 1, right? To what? 0 0.95 of synchronous speed. To the new speed, let me call it say N2, is what? 0 0.95 of the synchronous speed. So at this point, I can find a slip S2. Remember that slip is what? Slip is always synchronous speed minus running speed over synchronous speed. So this will give me what? 1 minus 0 0.95. That will give me 0 0.05. So this is my S2. This is my slip 2. Let me be sure that I'm doing the right thing. Okay, that's my slip 2. This is that what? From this to this, in the shortest possible time, neglecting stator resistance, calculate the value. So we should neglect R. We we'll take R to be zero, R1 to be zero. It means B is zero. Right? Okay. Calculate the value of the rotor resistance referred to the stator and the minimum time to reach 0 0.95 of synchronous speed. So we have to find what? Because you find the value of the rotor resistance referred to the state of and the minimum time. Once you're supposed to find minimum time, T min, it means you must find what? You must find S max optimum. You must find S max optimum. And we saw the formula for S, S max optimum, right? We saw the formula for S max optimum. We know that it's equal to square roots. Of what S1 squared minus S2 squared over 2 log to the base E S1 over S2 plus 2B S1 minus S2. But since B is zero, it means this component goes away. So my S max optimum, S max optimum. Will be equal to square root of initial slip is one one squared is one one minus zero point zero five squared all over two multiplying log to the base e one over zero point zero five calculator work put this in the calculator you get zero point four zero eight this is how you find your s max optimum so you find your s max optimum now that, we, now that we have our S max optimum, we are supposed to use S max optimum to find the word to find. First question says that find the here. Find the value of the rotor resistance referred to the stator. So that's R2 prime optimum. Okay. So we know that R2 prime optimum. R2 prime we know that R2 prime optimum is equal to what? S max optimum times square root of 
R1 squared Xe squared. R1 was 0. Xe was 1. So this becomes 1. So I just get 0 0.48 times 1. That's 0 0.408. So 0 0.408. Okay, so yes, I found my I found my R two optimum too. Now, the next question is fast to find what fast to find the minimum time. Fast to find the minimum time. So now that I have my S max optimum, is that what put in put the S max optimum into the traveling time formula that we know. That will be the minimum time. So we know that when that traveling time is given by what. Traveling time is given by tau over 2k, right? Tau over 2k multiplying everything we have here. And the last, the last component goes because b is zero. So we just refer to the formula. Okay. You found your S max optimum. Put in your S max optimum. Put everything inside. Now we say you need tau. Tau is tau is j omega s over t max so i need t max this is the formula for t max we wrote it down so find t max now go ahead once you have t max you can find your tau because tau is j omega s over t max omega s is synchronous speed i'm cleaning this please omega s is synchronous speed synchronous speed is what 120 f over p but this is in ref per min so multiply by 2 pi over 60 to change to rad so that's what they did there. So that'll give you your tau. Once you have my tau, once I have my tau, I can find my T min. Right. Yes, we say K K is what? K is E S max plus one. And B is zero. So K is one. That's how come the down was just two times one. So it's formula work. Formula work. As I said initially, it's formula work. It's more formula work. More formula work. More formula work. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. Now, let's take the next example. A 480 volt 60 hertz three phase induction motor has a rated speed at full load of. We've been given the full load speed. Full load speed at 1120 rep per minute. Full load speed. Let me call it. Let me. The omega full load is 112. Zero rev per min. One one two zero rev per min. The stator resistance of so it has R one of one, and the rotor resistance refers to the primary. So R two prime is one. X is five. So I'm having R one to be one, R two prime to be one. X e is five. The inertia of the motor is four kilogram meter squared. J is four kilogram meter squared. Calculate the starting time of the motor at no load and full load voltage. Calculate the starting time of the motor at no load and full voltage. At no load and full. You are just find the time. So you put the time formula. Put the time formula tau over 2k s1 over s2 and all those things that we need, right? Let me come here. Hold on a bit here. So we need to find t max. If I have t max, I can find s max. I need to find s max too. Find b. If I find b, I can find k. So you see, so it's more once once you have the formulas, once you have the formulas, you put it in. So just we put it in. Okay. So that'll give you 5.2 seconds. Let me explain something here. So the slip is starting. Right. It's starting. So it means you know, you have an initial slip of one. And then a good approximation is to assume that the final slip at no load is two percent. 
You see, remember, remember we mentioned somewhere that it, it reaches the final speed at about 95 to 98%, right? Yes. So the final speed is about 95 to 98% of the rated speed. We hand the slip, we can approximate it. But he says that, I asked him and he told me that, he said that in the exams, we we'll give us what to use. So we shouldn't worry about the approximation used here. But that's this, that's what we have here. Right, sure. So, mm, So that's it. So that's how that's how we go ahead to come. So as for the induction, as for traveling number of induction models, it's formula way. We will take some other examples, right? Some MCQs in our crash course, and then we'll see we'll see more examples. We'll see more examples in it. Okay. Let me hold on a bit. Hello. Right, let's move on. So now we are done with the we are done with the traveling time of induction motors. We can now go to chapter three. That's electric braking. So the next thing we look at is electric braking. Looking at electric braking, right? Let's start. Electric braking. So please kindly take time to do the reading part. Okay, I'll be, I'll be dealing more with the calculation part, the analysis, electric braking. We have three types of electric braking. We have regenerative. We have regenerative. We have rheostatic braking. And then we have the reverse current breaking. The reverse current breaking. So now this is how this is how the force go. Okay. Now we we apply brakes in two situations. One, we can apply brakes when we are lowering a heavy load. When you are lowering a load, you apply brakes so that what you control the rate at which the drop is. Or to, you can also apply brakes when you are stopping or slowing down. When, when you are stopping or slowing down, you apply brakes so that you can stop at a precise location or you can stop within some specific time. So these are the two conditions that will necessitate us to apply braking. Okay. So now we will look at these types of braking first we'll take lowering a load right let's look at lowering a load so in lowering a load we we'll look at regenerative braking for dc shunt dc shunt or separately excited motor okay then we'll look at this same when lowering a load for DC series model. So re regenerative braking, restarted braking, reverse braking for DC series model. Then now we'll come to during stopping. So for stopping to for the stopping to also look at regenerative restarted and reverse current for stopping DC shunt motor. And the same way for stopping DC series motor. So that's how that's the arrangement. That's the arrangement. Okay. So let's see. Now let's take our first, let's take regenerative braking. As I said, please do, do the reading. I'll be doing more of the calculations. So do the reading. Okay. Now let's take regenerative braking. Say I have, so let me take the characteristics of a DC shunt motor. Take the characteristics of a DC shunt motor, like this, All right? If I have a torque here, this torque TL, so this is my low torque, this is my motor torque, 
It means this drive is operating at this this, this speed one. Equal to one. Right. Now, assuming my load is a bidirectional load torque load. Right. This means that when I'm moving in one direction, the torque is moving in another direction. So for example, for example, let me take a vehicle moving up a hill, right? For example, this when I'm going up the hill, the torque is acting this way. So the torque has one direction. The speed is taking the motor up. So if the speed is positive, since the torque is moving opposite to the speed, it means the torque will also have a positive sign. Now, during the downhill motion, the speed is still positive. Speed has not changed, still positive, right? But this time, the torque is now aiding the motion. The torque is supposed to oppose the motion. So since the torque is aiding the motion, then the torque now becomes negative. This is what we call a bidirectional torque. So in the this uphill, this uphill. Now for the downhill, for the downhill, the torque becomes negative. For the downhill, the torque becomes negative here. So that's what this graph means here. Downhill, the torque becomes negative. And this can be the new steady state speed too. So regenerative braking is applied at this region here. I hope it makes sense. Okay. You can see that in regenerative braking, in regenerative braking of a bidirectional torque load, load, torque load. Sorry, you see that what speed is positive. The speed remains positive, right? But the torque becomes negative. That's what you must know. But if I take a unidirectional, in a unidirectional torque, for example, like this, this diagram for unidirectional load torque. So that one for the uphill, it goes like this. For the downhill, the torque also the torque remains positive. Because it's acting in one direction, but the speed reverse, the speed becomes negative because it's now coming down. So this can be the characteristics for the this one. Right. Now to apply regenerative braking to this, to occur in the negative direction. So it's to come here. So for regenerative braking of DC chance motors for any any directional low torque. Realize that here the torque remains positive by the speed that becomes negative. We'll see how we use all these formulas. Let me get to the examples right now. Just listen. So if I take omega, I know that omega is equal to what? D over K phi minus R A T L over K phi squared. I know this. If I take this formula here, right? If I'm working for a bidirectional torque, this TE, sorry. If I'm working for a bidirectional torque, it means that I'll put in a negative value here. But if I'm working for a unidirectional torque, it means the torque remains positive. But it is the speed here that becomes negative. When we take the examples, all these things will make sense. Okay. So that's it. This is the knowledge we need to solve the questions under the so do the reading part. Take time to do the reading part. All these parts, read, read, read. Especially about this diagram. Take your time to read all these parts. Okay. Okay. Yes, I was talking about this too. Directional, bidirectional, I was talking about all these. Let's, let's, let's get to the example. The with example to explain something more concept. They have what a 220 volt DC shunt motor. Let me check if I'm still on. Oh. A 220 volt DC shunt motor has an amateur resistance. So they're giving me V is equal to what 220 volt. RA is RA is. 0.06 RA is 0 0.06 ohms 0 0.06 ohms now it says that 
and with full field has an emf of 215 volts at a speed of 960 rpm so when e when e is equal to 215 speed n is given by what 960 rpm then they say that what calculate the minimum okay give me that the motor is driving an overhauling load with a torque of 172 newton meter so an over an overhauling load is a bi-directional torque load keep it in your mind an overhauling load is bi-directional torque load bi-directional so the question says that what the question says that calculate the minimum speed at which the motor can hold the load by means of regenerative braking. So we know that speed is equal to what? Speed is equal to V over K5 minus R A T E over K5 squared. I have my V here. I have my V here. I have to find K5. How do I find K5? I, I know R A T. You know that at steady state or at holding conditions, T E is equal to T L. So this T E becomes equal to T L. We are looking at a bi-directional torque load, right? We are looking at bi-directional torque load. This is TL. This is negative TL. This is TE. So at this point here, TE is equal to TL, as we can see here. Yeah. Okay. So how do I find my K5? I know that E is equal to what? E is equal to K5 omega. E is equal to K5 omega. K5 is equal to what? K5 is equal to E over omega right i was giving my e to be 215 e is 215 omega is in one per second so i'll do 960 times 2 pi over 60. this give me 215 over 32 pi so this value is this 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 will give me 32 pi so i get 215 over 32 pi 215 over 32 pi so you punch it okay yes now that i have my k pi i can now do substitution so i'll say okay omega will be equal to v 220 over k pi which is 215 over 32 pi minus r a 0 0.06 or 0 0.062 0 0.062 r a times te which is equal to tl but because it's bi-directional it means it's now what negative tl so negative the top was what 172 i guess negative 172 so yeah i'll put in negative 172 so that that's the tricky part that's the part that you can easily miss over k5 squared five k5 is 215 over 32 pi all squared so put it into the calculator when you do this, you get your answer to be thing 105 point something. I, I, I don't have a calculator here. But you're 105 point something rad per second. So to change it to revolutions per minute, multiply your answer by 60 over 2 pi. So 105 times 60 over 2 pi. That'll give you 1004 point. You get 1004. So 1004.65. 1004.65. So that's it. That's it here. 1004.65 RPM. So that's how you work with the formula. Knowing whether it's bidirectional or unidirectional, how it affects the formula. Let's move on. Hope this makes sense. Let's move on. So let's take the next question. Then he says that a DC separately excited motor has an amateur resistance of 0 0.5 K5 of 3. The motor is driven by a single phase fully controlled AC bridge rectifier converter. So I have a converter here, right? I have some input here. Input is what? The input to the converter is 277 volts. I have some 277 volts here. And I'll take the output of the converter. So that becomes my V that drives the motor. 
Okay. Now, what you must know from pan electronics is that the V at the output of an AC converter, V is equal to 2 root 2 E over pi cos alpha. That's the first thing you must know. Okay. Now, the motor is used to drive a forklift, which is a unidirectional torque load. So, forklift is unidirectional. It means that what the torque is positive. The torque remains constant. Right? But it's the speed that becomes negative during the braking. That's what you must know. The speed becomes negative during the braking for a unidirectional torque load regenerated. So let's move on. Is that in the upward direction, the mechanical torque is 100 newton meter. So in the upward direction, torque, what was 100 newton meter. 100 newton meter and the triggering angle is 20 degrees so they're giving us the alpha this alpha is called the triggering angle so alpha is 20 degrees so straight away i can find the v at the output that drives the motor so v is equal to 2 root 2 times e e is 277 over pi times cos 20. that'll give my v okay now see that in the downward direction the load torque is 200 newton meter. Calculate the triggering angle required to keep the downward speed equal in magnitude to the upward speed. So first, let's find the upward speed. Omega is equal to V over K5 minus RATE over K5 squared. So for the upward, my V will give me, if I compute this, I'll get, if I compute that value there, I'll get 234.35. 234.35. So I get 234.35 over K5. That was 3. Minus RA. RA was 0 0.5 times upward. The torque was 100. Over 3 squared. This speed. I get the speed. For the upward motion. This is the speed. The thing is, you get 72. Now know that in the downward motion, in the downward motion, what happens? The speed becomes negative in the downward motion, but torque still remains positive. So they said that in the question, they said that they said that how play the triggering angle required to keep the downward speed equal in magnitude to the upward speed. So for the downward speed computations, we have to make the speed negative. You have the same magnitude, but it will be negative of it. So that's what you must know. That because it's unidirectional, the speed becomes negative. So it's supposed to be 72.56. And because it's unidirectional, the speed becomes negative. So we are supposed to find a new triggering angle. So what, what I'll do is that, kindly pay attention here. What I'll do is that, from this formula, Omega is equal to V over K5 minus RAT over K5 squared. From this formula here, from this formula here, I'll put in Omega is equal to negative, we're not looking at a downward motion, so negative 72.56. And I'll find the V for this, so 3 minus RA 0 0.5 TE. Now, on the step of the downward motion, take the torque to be 200 over 3 squared. So, I'll find a V. That will give me this speed here. And once I know the V for a converter here, it's like this time, I've been given the V here. So, if I solve for this, if I solve for this, I'll get the V to be negative 184.35. So, V is, so I get my V, which is the output here. Be negative 184.35. I have my E here. I must find a triggering angle. Can you know that V is equal to 2 root 2 E over pi cos alpha? So I'll find my cos alpha here. So, so that'll give me what? That'll give me. That'll give me. Hold on a bit for me. So I want to find cos alpha. So V V is 
negative 184.35 times pi over two root two e. E was e was two one five. No, e was two seven seven. Sorry. Then I'll find cos inverse of this. Cos inverse of this will be my alpha. So that's it. So you have to understand this bidirectional, unidirectional torque load. And you just use the fundamental formula. That's all you use. And you get the answer. So for bidirectional torque, torque becomes positive. Torque becomes negative. Speed is positive still. For unidirectional, torque remains positive, but speed becomes negative. Okay, now for the motor in two, the operator during the upward motion changes the triggering angle to keep the motor at holding position. How play the triggering angles? There's a new triggering angle that will keep the motor at holding position. At holding position means that. At holding position means that. It means speed is equal to zero. So omega is equal to v over k phi minus r a t e over k phi squared. At holding position, omega is zero. So make omega zero and find the v. That's it. Zero point five times. 200 downward motion so times 200 over 3 squared find the v and come and you do the same thing you know here to be 277 the v you find will be here then put it in the formula e over pi cos alpha is equal to v and find your alpha just like we saw right now so that's it so Okay, during the upward motion, changes the triggering angle. Okay, during the upward motion, you use the 100 because you say that the upward motion, the torque was the 100. So you use the 100 at that point. Does it make sense? Yeah. In an upward motion. That's it. That's, that's how you go about it. That question. Now let's look at our last question for today. That's the for today. A DC is a bit excited, so it's the same thing. The green has RA K5. The DC source with the V is 200. The motor is driving a forklift whose torque is 180 Newton. A regenerative braking is applied by switching the terminal voltage of the motor towards to a 30 volt reverse polarity DC supply. Let's see. So I said they said that was speed is what speed is V over K phi minus R A T E over K phi squared. Now they said that the V applied is what V is 30 volt reverse polarity. So the V becomes negative 30 over K phi. K phi is 3. So you don't need the 200. K phi is 3. R is 0 0.5. Torque is 180. So 3 minus 0 0.5 times 180 over 3 squared. And that, that's how you go about it. Yeah. So that's it. That's it for generation break. That's it for regenerative break. We will end here for today and we will continue at that time. Thank you very much for your time.